uh, devotion was diminishing. Besides that then, it became very, very voguish in Europe and the United States for the religious orders to send their men to secular universities. The plea was, if they go to secular universities, they will know what the other side are saying, as if you couldn't read it in their books and listen to it in their lectures. The result was they turned out a generation, my generation, of thinkers, theologians, bishops later, cardinals later, who had absorbed secularist ideas and with all their friends and careers and honorableness linked with a world which is totally anti-Catholic. And that was part of the seeding for Vatican II. Uh, now, that was the first thing that, that those two things that part of the twelfth is. The third thing he hit very hard, but always just touching it because he hadn't read the third secret, was the coming destruction of the church and of civilization. It's a note you find in creeping into his public sermons and addresses and in some of his letters because he had he had got communications from Lucia, Sister Lucia, the surviving child of Fatima and from others about what Our Lady had said was going to happen. But by the time he got to that, his main work was done. His main work was during the war. Uh, that was his main work to resist Nazism, to resist Mussolini and to tie the church over that period. That was, I think, what Providence called him for. After that, and then he did manage to keep Italy out of communism by organizing the, the, the Demo Christiani, the Democratic Party in Italy. By that, by 1950, when he defined the Assumption of Our Lady, which was one of his big acts, he was already in bad health. And from then on, he slid down a very slippery slope of very bad health. And finally, he succumbed in 1958. October, I think it was, 1950. Let's take a look at John the Twenty-Third. Was he a liberal? Or was he simply naive? He was a liberal. He was a very, very liberal. As you know, John was removed from teaching at the Lateran University because of modernism, way back in the beginning of his career. In fact, he could have ended there. He could have ended up as a parish priest in Bergamo, except he had friends in the propaganda, uh, the, uh, the, uh, it was called that time propaganda fide, that is the propagation of the faith, dissemination of the evangelical message. And they gave him a job, and then he went on to another job. But then they found he was very useful as a diplomat, because John was very calm and roly-poly, and obviously meant well, and as the French said about him, he was bon fourchette, he was a good fork, could eat a good uh, hearty meal of pasta, he was great at children's communion, and he was very kind. He did save innumerable thousands of Jews in Hungary during the war by uh, issuing about 27,000 false baptismal certificates which were passed around and saved them. And in Bulgaria, the same thing. As you know, the Jews in Bulgaria, there were more Jews in Bulgaria at the end of the war than there were at the beginning because of the activity of both the king of Bulgaria at that time and the archbishop and uh, Ron Kelly. And then he was very useful in Paris after the war with de Gaulle because de Gaulle couldn't dislike this man. And de Gaulle, the Vatican big problem in France after the war was that many bishops had supported the Vichy, the pro-German faction in France, and they were, sure they were condemned to death in principle. So John maneuvered the church out of that difficulty. Then he was made patriarch of uh, Venice as a reward, and nobody expected him to become pope. But in 1958, he was the only man they could light upon because the cardinals were in disarray about what to do about the church at that time. Yes, he was a liberal. And in addition to that, he was theologically ignorant, extremely ignorant. He had the garden of the soul variety of devotionalism. If you read his diary of the soul, it's very simple, simplistic almost. Um, he was wily, as a peasant is. He came from peasants who had been, who had been fighting with the, the elements and land and animals for hundreds of years. Uh, he was... Uh, Monoglot, really, he spoke uh, French, but he was Italian and monoglot. He spoke one language. And above all, he had an illusion that if he managed to get as many different people as possible, Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Muslims, Communists, uh, Hindus, Buddhists, into his Vatican Council, there would be a new Pentecost. The Holy Ghost actually enlightened everybody with a new flaming uh, deluge of tongues and the world would be one again, in love and faith in Christ. So he was chasing an illusion. Absolutely. Chasing an illusion. Uh, then he was also... See, he also had uh, another view completely of Europe and Marxism. He was capable of the poor, and therefore he did think the imbalance between poor and rich should be corrected. That, of course, was taken by his Marxist collaborators as a way of pushing him towards a compromise with Nikita Khrushchev. No, John was a liberal, and uh, unfortunately, his piety was not sufficient to give him perception. He did go to Fatima, by the way, uh, as, as a cardinal, and um, he did want to be known as the Pope of Fatima, and he did institute a feast day of Our Lady of Fatima. But when it came to the Fatima revelations and the mandate of Our Lady, because it directly, head-to-head -head on, 
went against his Ostpolitik, his policy of reconciliation with Soviet Union, he would have none of it. And therefore he said, this is not for our time. And the question what one would have loved to have asked him is, why didn't our lady tell us that? If she says, in 1960 the Pope must open this and public it, publicize it to all the nations of the world. Nobody didn't dare, wouldn't dare ask him that. Before John the Twenty Third died, did he realize that something was starting to go wrong? Yes, he did. Insofar as his carcinoma allowed him, because from March on, John was in a very bad condition, March 1963. He died on June 3, and in a horrible agony of hours of horrible pain. But he used to say at the end, it's no longer non il mio concilio. This is no longer my concilio. After the first session, he knew that the anti-force had taken over. Because, as you know, in his preparation for the council, he had a preparatory commission. And they prepared what they called schemata, that is, documents, which would be discussed by the bishops in council. They'd modify it, change it, adapt it to their individual needs and the uh, needs of the church universal, and then stamp it with their signature. Archbishop Lefebvre was on this council, wasn't he? He was. He was. Archbishop Lefebvre was. What happened was, in the first session, they simply said, we don't want these documents. We've got to have new documents. And the new documents were exactly tailored to the, that blessed ambivalence they wanted. And from then on, he knew the council was going down. Physically, then, you see, the carcinoma was eating away at his vitals, and he was already over 80. And uh, he simply physically hadn't the strength. And apparently, he hadn't got the grace, or Christ didn't want him to do anything. Because over all this burnout, over all this mess, this disintegration of the Catholic Church in its institutional organization and the infidelity of priests and nuns and cardinals and bishops and the connivance, say, amongst European cardinals against John Paul II and amongst American cardinals against John Paul II at the present moment. Overall, you must say to yourself, this has been permitted by Christ. He is, after all, all-powerful. He could change all hearts. He hadn't. He has allowed it go like that. So this is permitted by Christ, not willed. It's something you must reflect on, we must all reflect on, that he has allowed it. He has allowed this victory of Satan, because it is a victory, a marvelous victory. It's a terrible victory for us, but for him it's a superb victory. He has successfully infiltrated the church in its highest levels, right up to the throne of Peter. So we must say that about John III, so that he wasn't given the grace to see what the errors he made. And Paul VI wasn't given the errors to correct his weakness. He was a great pope in other ways, but he could not correct them. Why? He didn't get the grace. That's the most charitable thing we can say. Let God judge him. As you know, poor Paul VI went around Castle Gandalf on his last days, shuffling, because he had terribly swollen legs with phlebitis, besides his lungs were giving out. And all they could hear him say when he didn't think anybody was with him were, read the conversation, little stretches from the credo. Credo in unum deum, credo in ecclesium catholica, credo in unum deum, credo in Christum dominum. As if to assure himself on the verge of eternity and that it all held still intact. He seemed to be somewhat helpless as a pope. Totally, totally helpless, totally helpless. He was already coddled and swaddled in the folds of the super force installed in the Vatican, and he could do nothing about it, just as Paul, John Paul II perhaps. The only thing is that John Paul II, coming from a distant land, being a fighter, having his own geopolitical point of view, has decided on an end game. He's going to double right around it, he says, and thinks and plans. He is not Paul VI, he is not an Italian, and he is not John III, he has no illusions. This man has no illusions at all. What is his game plan? Or what was his game plan when he came to office in 1978? Geopolitical. That is, he accepted the fact that there was no possibility of renewal. No way he could scour out the church. No way he could reform the commons. No way he could clean out the Vatican bureaucracy. No way he could uh, change the mass of the clergy in Latin America. No way he could save the Jesuits. He tried to suppress them. That was his intent originally, in removing the general of the Jesuits. And finally, even, he stopped even there. So there was no point in any further attempt. But he did believe and does believe and holds firmly that he is the watchman on the wall waiting for Our Lady to come in the skies. It sounds fantastic. That is his belief. That will happen in his lifetime and soon, and soon, not late. And we're now in the banner years of that. You know... A lot of people didn't understand and didn't even take time to understand him in 1987. He established the Marian year. No, 1988, established the Marian year. He began in the middle of June and ended in August. And nobody said, why should have a Marian year, which is long, or 13 months, and which apparently went nowhere? He was preparing for Gorbachev and the present shake-up of the entire structure of the world, the society of nations. But that's another question. If you and this is, this is a topic which we will take up in our final tape on Inside the Vatican.